Welcome. Today is January 23rd, 2023. My name is Michael Pierre Price. I'm going to be moderating this first uh, Texpressionism Roundtable of 2023. Actually, the second roundtable in the series. We had one last year. The roundtable expands upon the established artist interview series that um, we've all been a part of and we've shared. And this really allows us to delve in a little bit deeper upon a subject. And um, Texpressionism was uh, initiated by our friend Colin Goldberg, and it's been an ongoing artist worldwide community for the last two and a half years or so, where we get together uh, periodically every couple weeks on Zoom. And I'm pleased to have with me today, Roz Diamond, uh, Tommy Mintz, and Renata Yanishevska. And we are going to be talking today about approach or artistic approach. And if you can see above me, I have the definition of Texpressionism, and it is an artistic approach in which technology is utilized as a means to express emotional experience. So as Texpressionist artists, what does approach mean to us? Um, both in terms of our uh, way in which we create our art, what we say about our art, and beyond. So I'm going to let uh, Renata begin uh, the discussion by presenting her viewpoint on what approach means. Renata. Thank you, Michael. And hello, Roz and Tommy. <laughs> It's a real pleasure to be speaking to you here from Lion's Head, Canada. I was reading a book recently and I came across uh, some, some words by the artist Annie Albers, wife of Joseph Albers. And it related to how I think about my approach when I make digital artworks. She said, limitations may act as directives and may be as suggestive as were both the material itself and anticipated performance. Great freedom can be a hindrance because of the bewildering choices. Limitations can spur the imagination to make the best use of them. And that was from a recent book published by the writer Jed Pearl. And the title of the book is Authority and Freedom. And I think that in Texpressionism, we have some limitations that are automatic, just in terms of the software that we use and the screen that we're working on. But it's more for me, it's more of a set, making a set of parameters around the work. So host has disabled screen sharing. I just got on my screen as I attempted to share. Very good. Okay. You should be good to go now. Okay. Okay. Um, you see in front of you the detail of one of my paintings. When I showed this to an art historian friend of mine, she said immediately, Bosch. And it's a biomorphic shape that I create using a particular software program. And it's part of a larger work. And here's another, this emerald shape is part of the painting as well. And the title of the painting is Lady Prunella and Fly the Emerald Ruffian. And coming out of that emerald shape is a purple brush stroke. So in addition to the shapes, I make these custom brushes using various materials. This was made with, with a photograph of plants. So, uh, there's a lot of floral 
references here. So this, for example, this area down here, these flowers were actually a photograph I took in Paris in a flower shop in 2017. And they then became part of a 2018 larger work where I used a lot of explosions. I exploded and spattered the paint around these photos, but then they ended up being the canvas for this particular shape. And here's another shape that's a, a custom brush, this green here and this one there. This one has almost a sensation of fabric. You can almost see like little stitches and another custom brush here. To see the whole work, uh, you get a different perspective on what's going on. This one is an illustration of layers. And I was just um, rem remembering that in the work of Ross Diamond, you can see hundreds of layers if you know how to look at them. So I'm really happy with how our programs that we use enable us to layer one, one background and then one brush stroke and then another brush stroke. And then there's a shape here. It's 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 very liberating in a sense, even though I always try to impose a color palette limitation. And here's another one where when you zoom in, you can see that it's almost flat, this 3D shape, and it's got a lace-like quality to it. And then behind it, you have the same brush that we saw in the first work, and you have this very spiky shape. Another custom brush here. Um, this piece I'm showing you because I feel like this is the most successful piece that I've done. Now you're looking at a detail right now, but it's the best piece of the last six months. And it, it's based on an earlier piece. And part of my approach is that I cannibalize my, my work all the time. I'm constantly looking at my work and pulling bits out of it. So in this case, I had a drawing that I really liked with this dark blue background and these shapes, these pink shapes in the foreground. And what I did was I glitched it. And then I painted over top of the glitching with paint, with different various brushes, like the stripe brush here. These, all these dots were applied individually. They're not a brush, they're just drawn. I drew them onto the canvas. And then these lines are a custom brush. So if you look, at the bigger picture. This was really the beginning, this square here. And then I just made a border because why not? You know, I like having things that trail off the end. And I'm showing you this because this is a still from one of my animations. And I happened to capture this moment and I really liked how the shape was suspended in the air. You can really feel the dimensionality of this line. And really, basically, it's just a, a line that I drew. But the software put, you know, the, the shapes on top of it and gave it that, that uh, recession into space kind of feel. Here's another one in which I use uh, custom brushes that I make out of the work of the Belgian illustrator and graphic novelist Hergé, who did the beloved Tintin books. So this one here, this particular brush is a Tibetan, Tintin Tibetan, it's a, it's, a, it's a monument in the, in the Himalayas. And the brush enables you to change the color of, the, of it. It's amazing to me how absolutely crystal clear that every line is. And when you think about how we're zoomed in here at 300%, the resolution is quite remarkable. And another thing that's nice about the Tantan brushes is that they, um, they take on the color of the background of the painting. So this is a very recent work. I'm just showing it to you because I liked here the kind of antique aged look 
I achieved. The colors are very muted and it kind of looks like something from the 18th century, except of course, it's made in a very modern, with very modern techniques. And then finally, again, showing you some of these Tantan brushes, you see here how it takes on the, the background of the, of the work. That's the monument. And then this is a sequence where he's trying to save a, a pot, a very expensive pot from crashing to the ground. And you see the brush here on the other side of the work as well, our hero. So, um, oh no, I'll just zoom out on this for you. That's that. Now I have um, a lot of issues with my animation being very choppy when shown over Zoom. So what I did for today is instead of showing you an animation, I'm going to show you uh, a film I made using the music from the animation. I will put the address of the high resolution version of this into the chat as soon as I finish showing you this one minute video. Um, what I did was I just took stills from the video and you hear the original music that I always add to my animations in the background. Um, there we are. Okay. Thank you, Renata. Welcome. Thank you. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about my animations because it's really something I'm delving into more deeply. I want to make five minute long ones now instead of one minute. So that's, that's where it's going. But it's just really hard to share them with people. There's a tremendous amount of work that goes into a one minute piece. Yeah. I work with very high resolution files. My, my files are always in 4K with stereo sound, but the only time people get to see them that way is if they can go to my Vimeo page yeah. or channel and look at my Vimeo things that I put there or on my website. It's just, it's disappointing when you, you know, I think we've all, yeah. Oh, uh, we're having issues with lion's head connection here. The resolution just isn't what it was. All right. So let, let's spend a couple minutes here. Um, the sense of, you know, our, our focus on approach, it uh, looks like a lot of it has been the ability to create um, brushes that are very interesting, uh, but help you create something. It, it's almost like atomic structure of your artwork, uh, which I find very, very fascinating. Um, and, and the other thing for me, I just find your titles of your works um, really out there in, in very playful, interesting, historical, uh, ways. And that's something I think a lot of times people don't give credence to is titles of works because so much in the title can help you understand kind of your approach or where you're coming from. And I was just kind of curious about, about that and whatever uh, Roz and Tommy might be thinking as well. 
So, uh, Renata, do you want to respond to that first before we jump in? You're muted. <laughs> yes, please go ahead, Roz. Um, uh, a few things. Um, I loved when you explained that your custom made brushes. I just kind of wondered uh, how how those evolve, but they they really are quite beautiful and interesting. The high resolution when you get into them, how high they are when you're up close. And I also um, noticed how you're uh, something I've been noticing in other people. I think it's Sue Byer uh, and a few others and things that I've thought about where you're breaking through the square a little bit with that new feathery, beautiful piece you just did there. You know, we're all in this box. We're in a box right now, four boxes in a box and a box and a box. And I look <laughs> out my window and, you know, it's not like that, but we're in the pixelated world and it, it is kind of like that. So yeah. I think it's kind of brave and I'm thinking about it too. How do I break out of that square? And I think it'd be a great topic for a future to expressionism breaking the square or something like that, you know, Good idea. but I, I appreciated that you're, you're pushing, you know, you're pushing, you might like parameters, but you take them and you're, you're going past them. <laughs> so. Thank you. so I was reaching behind me to pull out this picture. I'm not sure if you can see it. I love how Roz was talking about breaking the squares or embracing the square, setting up rules. Renata, I'm not sure. This is a picture by um, Gary um, Edler. B E Y D L E R from 1976. It's called 20 Minutes in April. And it's him holding mirror uh, up to the sky, sort of reflecting back the clouds back to the sky and, and having this kind of um, play upon you know, this rule, if you will, this structure of clouds and mirrors or windows into clouds. You know, I, th I think we're, um, uh, it's really exciting to see that kind of. Um, play with this the edge right because you're playing on the edge there's a, a tension to that mm -hmm. edge quality um and uh, you're talking about layers too i feel like you're layering these edges right sort of increasing the amount of edge that an image can contain is is another compelling so you know exciting thing to see bernardo it's um yeah so one of the questions that i had coming to this round table today, Michael, and I didn't prepare as much as Renata, but, um, but I'm happy to sort of propose a, a question that I was thinking about, and maybe Renata could respond to is like, um, we're working with our digital tools in a specific way as artists. Um, and we have been for a couple of years now. And at this moment, we're experiencing AI coming in, right? And we have this um, moment of reckoning of, oh, here's a new set of tools, Right. I'm not asking you, are you incorporating the tools or not? But how do you think it's changed your understanding of what we could put in the square or visually? I mean, I recognize AI art as sort of like a a new aesthetic in a way, a new, a new set of visual images that you know I see repeated. They're almost tropes. I look a lot on, you know, sort of the NFT marketplace. And there's a lot of recognizable forms that and the AI takes regularly. So um and I'm thinking about that, Renata, in relation to your repeated use, and that's why I was holding this mirror picture up, your repeated use of, of you know, um, Tintin uh, in, in, you know, catching the vase, you know, in repeated fashion over and over in, in this, that um, I feel like is quoting back to our, and I don't want to talk generation, generationally here, but, you know, this sort of paper experience of, um, you know, uh, reading a comic and, and maybe reading it again and reading it again, because that's the one book you have on, you know, on the shelf that you're interested in as a kid kind of thing. Um, I don't know if this is a rambling question and I should stop and I'm gonna turn off my mic in a moment. But um, I'm wondering if, if you think, you know, in this moment where like we're shifting from maybe digital to AI, is there like a relation between like the shift from analog to digital that's comparative that we've experienced in our lives that you think you've incorporated into your work already in these digital brushes? I think that the word that's jumps out at me is the, the word tension. When you spoke about the tension, I feel that we live in this age of tremendous anxiety that, you know, kids, all of them are complaining about it. Adults are complaining about it. And that is something that an artist can work with and, and shape it and make their work more, more dynamic, more compelling you know you want people to get involved in your image you want them to get look deep into it 
And sometimes it's soothing, you know, art can soothe. That's what Matisse was always on about. So I don't know if I answered exactly what you were talking about with AI. I mean, I stopped using AI after six months because I was just so unhappy with how poor the resolution sizes are and they still are. But I did do a lot of work with it. And I mostly layered my own work over top of what the AI produced so that it wouldn't look that I had been using Mid Journey or another engine. Because I like that. I like the subversive quality of that. Being able to disguise an AI work. I'll still do it. I'm still trying to get back on now. <laughs> So it's interesting because you, you, you're using the AI to create uh, an aesthetic that you have preconceived and you're not looking. And it's interesting, you know, in the sort of uh, structure of, of creating work, do we think of what we're making first or do we start scribbling and then see what shows up and what we're picturing in our scribbles? Um, and it sounds like you really have something pre-pictured, then you try to get something from AI that would work with, you know, that you can um, put into that. So analog aesthetic, if you will. I don't know. So I, I think that's a good segue, Tommy, for you to to share uh, your your sense of approach and what that means. Um, so uh, just just to keep things moving along here, uh, you you have the floor now, Tommy. Um, or the screen. <laughs> thank you, Michael. I'm, as I said, I didn't um, prepare. A bunch. I thought I was just going to share the newest work and talk about um, what I'm working on right now. And let me see if I need to change the size of what I'm sharing, or if that's possible. <laughs> One second. Speaking sure. of details, um, I and layers. Uh, I I think Renata and I have a lot of the same language that we we talk about in our work, um, and and come to very different images that have some of the same. I think energy and tension. So I really like seeing Renata's work and seeing that, you know, sort of freshly in my memory of these different spiky forms that Renata was was you know presenting in, in especially the latest works. Um, that was sort of against the dark background, um, and uh, um, looking at the forms that I'm picking up in in my work. So um, I guess this is recorded, so I should explain what's going on for anybody who's watching this in the future. Um, I take a sequence of pictures um, and run them through an algorithm that I wrote that detects areas of difference, creating time-lapse collages. Um, and it's not AI. It's it's really um, pixel by pixel. Uh, what's different? If you know if a pixel is lighter or darker or a different color, it gets added on. So um, there is no sort of edge detection or or object recognition occurring. And that actually creates, I think, these interesting, striking forms that uh, don't make sense on first glance. But if you um, spend a little time letting, you know, you sort of uh, like pattern recognition, um, click through a couple layers of visual information there, um, things show up in, in a way that uh, I think is, is a, a playful way that digital presentation and language, you know, sort of interacts with our sort of understanding of, of you know, what we sort of recognize as a thing <laughs> in a place, in a, in a specific time. Um, so, so there's a lot of detail in the images that I'm working with as well. Um, it's another similarity that I love with Renata's work where you sort of zoom in and you get a level of interaction and detail and information that, um, you know, if you zoom out, uh, you, you um, have a very different, maybe, sort of sense of, of space, of place, of time, of movement. Um, uh, so, yeah, I think um, I'm just going to scroll through a few and zoom in and out of just a couple of recent images. So this is a picture that is um, photographed on one of the streets that I uh, spent a lot of time on as a kid, uh, 8th Street and 6th Avenue. Um, right here used to be um, one of the great hot dog places, um, Grace Papaya. And um, down the street was one of the great poster stores that I used to go to as a kid and still sort of think of as the great place to go. Um, this used to be B. Dalton Booksellers forever, you know, independent bookstore. Um, I love the leaning uh, broom in this uh, moment here where the 
person who's, uh, I forgot to start my timer. Michael, you need to wave to me when I start going over time. Cause I didn't start a timer. I see my timer over here. It's like 10 minutes. <laughs> I didn't start it. Um, so, so, I mean, these are elements that I look at. I look at the colors and stuff that I'm, um, I'm uh, passing cars. I'll wait for a certain car to pass like a yellow taxi and in, in order to add those colors um, on both sides of the image, but also um, I'm very interested in the edge of the frame and the way that uh, images are, are sort of moving beyond these little boundaries, visual boundaries that, that we set up. I, there's a quote that I saw recently, I'm going to totally misquote um, and paraphrase, and I, I don't know who to cite, but it's something like, uh, future uh, civilizations will wonder at our subservience to the uh, rectangular image you know, or that we spend so much time with. So, um, yeah, I'm looking for, so I'm also thinking about at J. Um, uh, I, I think Eugene at J was a, a Parisian photographer and around the turn of the century, uh, 1900s, um, the early 1900s, there was a, 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 a lot of um, uh, construction going on in the city. He wanted to document these old um, places that were going to be, um, uh, you know, gentrified, I guess is what we call it now. But um, I, I find myself drawn to these old buildings that um, are about to come down as well. These vistas that are temporary in nature um, and spend time with them. Um, you know, it's obvious this is, you know, this beautiful old, old at this point building, the Empire State Building, which isn't, you know, the tallest building around anymore. There's buildings looming up above it. Um, and, and, um, yeah, uh, I think it's kind of representative of this moment of precarity that we do have that we're all sensing, um, you know, whether it's uh, you know, global ecologically or, or economically, um, uh, there's, there is a sense of precarity uh, in this moment, this tension, that I think, um, you know, staying within the boundaries might be a, a good um, metaphor for that um, tension. How am I on time? I can keep showing fine. pictures. Okay. So yeah, I um, I'm, I'm very interested in also uh, the persistence of nature in in the urban space. I am um, I, a Manhattanite. Uh, I've spent my whole life on this small island, seeing things change. Um, so I'm aware of both the, the temporary quality of the people in space, but also the buildings, um, and and also the kind of increasing um, presence of animals. Uh, both in the air and in the waters, uh, plants that I think uh, provide habitat for those animals. And I like to uh, document that maybe in a fantastical way sometimes, you know, we're sort of uh, imagining, maybe this is a nightmarish, uh, you know, sort of world with, with uh, you know, um, less of a presence of, of the human and, and more of uh, other species. Um, I think I have, let's see what, I have here. I have a lot of uh, Manhattan stuff here, but I do have uh, um, along the water here. Uh, this is a foggy day on a pier with a boat passing by um, multiple times. And then New Jersey, uh, the shoreline of New Jersey, <laughs> which has now been built up, um, showing through. Uh, I, I kind of love the detail when you zoom in on this one of the, the people on the boat, the spirit of New York that you see. Um, the way I shot this was actually I had my camera on a tripod and it was taking a picture every 12 seconds. So you could see how fast the boat was <laughs> passing. They were cruising slowly in the fog because um, you couldn't see anything. And then, um, yeah, I feel like that's a, a nice quiet uh, image compared to some of the visual density that I'm finding uh, you know, in the middle of the island. Um, yeah, here's some uh, color. I saw a photograph recently somebody uh, took from a rooftop uh, posted to Mastodon saying New York is just a sea of uh, gray rooftops and buildings. And, you know, it's true from certain angles. Um, you know, people who spend their time on rooftops often have criticism of others, but I won't go there, will I? Um, maybe I could stop on this picture. This is a nice blue picture. I, I do like the... Um, the different colors of graphic designs that move through the visual space of the streets. I, I'm very interested in text showing up in different places, both planned and maybe unplanned. You know, we're talking about graffiti uh, in in relation to um, signage that um, you know sort of 
serves a very similar element as a similar element in, in the images that um, you know will break up uh, a larger form and then of like this guy in the middle um you can zoom in and see you know, sort of all these different lives and stories you know that are intertwined within this uh, dense space um so i think that's a sort of an interesting approach as a digital artist um it's very different than um photography um can i stop the share did that work um you know the capacity is one of my my questions as an artist that I pose to myself is, you know, if we, we are thinking about the medium as um, uh, an integral component of our um, methods, of our processes, you know, what what is digital? What, and what does that add to our, you know, what, what is it, how is it different than uh, past processes? Um, I'm thinking analog photography in relation to digital photography. Um, in my own work, I, I bridge that you know, in my practice, I used to shoot film, now I shoot digital. And what's changed is, you know, I can certainly shoot many more pictures and, and do things very quickly to them and you know, repeatedly. This sort of uh, iterative um, process, I think, is a natural one. And I'm thinking also, again, about how a brush that we're not as using, if we're not to loop back to that, is, you know, repeating this pattern, this iterative thing. It's a very digital, native visual language that you've, you know, that you're using there to stitch an image. So I like that. I mean, do you see do you see your approach um, as maybe on a continuum, say to like the futurists when they were trying to figure out uh, how to express motion, how to express you know? But I mean, obviously that's you know a hundred years ago or so when the camera came out and and the movie came out, um, and so now, I mean. You know where does this go down the road? What I mean, what if your photography could include, uh, you know, the data that's being given off by people and you know, like their cell phone, and you know, all of a sudden you could create images that have data that links to other things. I mean, you know, it's it's just really kind of fascinating where all this can kind of head. Absolutely, and you know, it doesn't even have to be pictures that I'm taking or that I'm making. You know, the, there's um, all sorts of images that you could compress with that kind yeah. of data quality. Um, yeah. that I think it's, it's fascinating, and and the you know the, the 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 prevalence of video cameras in our lives right now is another thing that I'm you know, you know, highly aware of. You know, but I don't think that uh, we as artists are. <laughs> um, Going to get access to them anytime soon so i think we're just like talking about them in the abstract but yeah it'd be really cool if i could get like you know access to all the surveillance footage of you know a certain place and run you know all this data through you know some abstracting kind of form that creates an, an image out of it right or some sort of I, uh, I loved your presentation it was i i'm so drawn to your work um yeah. I often talk about the in-between and I will talk about that in my work, but I see that in yours. Yeah, you're capturing some kind of the in-between. I mean, uh, moments from one to the other that, I don't know, that disrupted in a way that, but that has a, speaks to now to me so much, you know? And I just, and the tension of, of your bikes, I mean, they're they're coming through, but they're they're still. And then you've got the buildings that are sitting and I keep thinking, well, you could do, you know, you could go back to ancient Rome and 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 combine it with now or whatever. But the whole thing that Renata was talking about, you know, parameters, um, this might turn into a question, but my questions are usually aren't, they're just just observations. Um, but um, you know, the whole thing about having the freedom, uh, the possibilities that we're talking about here are just so incredible. I mean, I don't know about you, but I sometimes I used to think, wow, this is incredible. Now I feel, God, I'm such a clunker. I cannot do. I can't do all the things I want to do. Um, so it's, um, you know, the grand magician. I mean, we we have, there's just so much out there. And with AI, you know, it's the questions we bring to it more than I think the answers is bringing back. I'm starting to give my own presentation as part of these questions, <laughs> but but you know what, that's, I I just, um, I don't know the question. I don't, I don't know that I have a question. I like your work very much. Um, yeah. I'd have a million questions. Thanks. I'd like to watch you in, uh, in process, you know, but thank you. Well, thanks, Rose. I do have process videos up on YouTube. It's not as exciting as it seems. I mean, I, 
typing in a lot of code and watching, you know, iterations go by. Maybe keep the secrets like, whoa, look at this. <laughs> yeah, right. I'll check them out. Okay. Uh, let's keep things moving along here. And uh, if you're ready, Roz, uh, have at it. Okay, I'm just going to preface quickly. I'm going to have to talk fast because I, my presentation may be too long, but you know, I'm a storyteller and it's all about stories within one still image has been the whole thing. So um, I started from the beginning and did 15 minutes of my life. So it's going to be fast, but it's all about approach and art and life intersections. So let me go to share screen. Are you guys seeing my screen? Yes, sure am. Okay, great. And it should be full screen, I suppose. Okay. Uh, I've been thinking lately, my mantra is to bring touch to the digital age. I think I've probably been doing that from the beginning and maybe all of us are, but it's, it's, it's something I use to describe my work. Um, and I don't know if we can go forward without going backwards. So I like that my two predecessor panelists have talked about everything from contemporary, uh, art historians like Jed Pearl to, um, you've mentioned influences in photography. Well, this goes back when we know this, it's Michelangelo and these two hands on the Sistine Chapel. And right in between, you know, God and man um, is this little gap there. And I think I've been trying to, to figure out what's in between those two fingers. Uh, that's part of my approach all the way. And um, I sort of define this as approach state one through six or seven. And I have a little equation, touch, digit, finger, heart, touch. A friend of mine, Paul Trackman, who's a really great painter and, and was with Smithsonian Magazine and art, science, music, everything. He's, he's a real um, Renaissance man. So, well, Roz, when you think about it, digit is finger, digit is touch. And, and I've always loved that. Um, it brings that humanness to this field, which is something I've always been trying to do. Beginnings. It's about finding your own self in the world. Um, I'm starting early where I, um, I, when I was born, I could draw. Now, I didn't do this drawing when I was born, but I got that from my grandmothers. But our skills are one thing, but what we do with them is another. And I'm showing this piece because teachers matter so much. And my teacher at Lamar Dodd School of Art said, well, this woman can draw very well, but what is she saying? And out of that came what I call my first really important uh, drawing. Um, I, I looked right past the model, and this was at the Lamar Dodd School of Art at the University of Georgia, and he had said, look, what is she touching? And I looked at this woman's face, and I went after it, and then I knew what art was about, and I took off. Um, so that approach, however, uh, a few years later, I was finding my first show um, I did a series of portraits and um, I'm on oil on canvas here. This is like a three foot by two foot portrait of my mother, along with several others through connections in Atlanta. I, I did people's portraits, you know, for what, like $5 and things. Not, not quite that cheap, but it, you know how it is when you're starting off. But it wasn't enough to just paint the person and even touch them. I never thought of myself as a technologist, but but I found myself taping my subjects. So when you came to the, into the show, which that I titled Talking Heads, all of the paintings were talking and um, it got a lot of attention. And um, I'm moving forward quickly. We're going on to our approach state two, touch, digit, finger, heart, touch, my little, little uh, diagram up there. Um, you're starting to touch the world. Things are happening. Your art, life takes you into this curveball into this whole new space, digital. Um, and, and, and you take on the world a little bit. It's not only, you know, you're, it's about you, but it's also about you bringing something to it and your expression. Well, I moved to Manhattan uh, away from Atlanta and my paintings took on, this is an oil painting about uh, three feet by two and a half. And, you know, even Picasso's woman, it's not enough for her, the blue woman paint, period, for her to be just be ironing. I had to give her plug in her iron I had to give her a television set and she's got all this myriad stuff going on. I mean, those that space between Michelangelo's fingers of, of the divine and the human is, I'm feeling in that space we can't see between each other and these squares and stories were coming up. And honestly, I didn't know what the hell is happening. I mean, my approach has been, I was seriously just responding to a world. And I mean, people who know me know that I, I can't, I can't operate any much, very much technology. So it's hard for me still. Um, Another thing about time was changing. I mean, I did uh, uh, quite a few. I mean, I've got a whole series of these pieces called information paintings. So as I was painting information, um, working in offices during the day to support my habit, you know, and um, 
this is called June and December because honestly, with our new technology, I'd be working in an office and just imagining walking in New York City and all of the stuff going on in between, in between that you can't see or feel, spiritual and mathematical. And I thought, wow, you can have June and December. Just turn on your TV and watch, you know, well, Baywatch. I never watched that, but you know what? I mean, watch something in summer right in the middle of February. And how does that happen? So I was starting to tape things in my canvases. This is a big piece. Um, and, and they were getting tighter and tighter. I'm going, okay, I'm moving quickly. But I was also starting to express myself. I was feeling more confident, you know? I learned how to say, bleep, bleep. I guess we're on text brushism. We know that means, fuck you. Anyway, so you can exit out later. But, you know, I was so liberated as a, as a Southern belle coming to New York and saying that word to people, and they didn't even give a damn, you know? I was just feeling so free. And I came home and painted my husband, who's been a wonderful supportive and very tech techie guy. He really is a techie guy. And I did a new version of the Odalisque. And the city buses used to stop outside our home in Soho um, and stop. We were on like the second floor of Charlton and Sixth Avenue. And it was backlit. And they go, now here's that news. And we all keep wondering what it's about. Okay, got to run. I'm, I'm going fast. Approach state three. What happens when the world takes us down? You know, we're, we're flying high. We all have these moments. And uh, no matter how rich or, or famous or anything you are, the world will take you down if you're out there feeling it. Um, it sends us curveballs of destruction we cannot imagine. How do we keep touching? What's our approach when that happens? Uh, looking back, I mean, look at this plane, how close it is to these towers. I mean, working, I worked in the World Trade Center for 10 years in um, digital media and the com commercial side. Fascinating, as well as working outside of it. And you have this incredible technology flying into these huge towers of might and power in the world with four guys with little, you know, box knife cutters or whatever. And what happened in that space? I mean, what a terrible day for the world and a reckoning that I still don't think we've talked about enough. But they're the offices where I used to work a week later. I mean, in 15 minutes, things can change. Um, my world was falling apart and I took the digital media to try to understand, it had come upside down. I don't think I've ever shared this piece with our group. Um, this is called Windows on the World, wow. And um, I was on my little Mac laptop and I kept flipping the world back and forth between the towers. And it's, it's kind of going between Islam and Christian Judaic culture and symbols like Barbie as a doll where you know a woman's supposed to be 36, 24, 36. Well, I, that's, that's, that's a straight jacket, just like a burqa if you ask me. So I was making a lot of comparisons. And, you know, I couldn't paint this many layers in my, my art. I've been trying to. And so I think I skipped that I went into digital media here, but we're going pretty fast. I, I definitely was in digital media now. I'm on a Mac. Oil paintings are, I don't know, I love them, but they may come back. And this dark period led me to a uh, different approach where I went, what's the point of doing an art show and showing how great I am? Me, 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 me. Uh, and I went and painted several icons after going to an iconography show that said art was a spirit of comfort to a nation besieged. And, and I was truly on my knees at that point and couldn't see the meaningfulness. So I went and wrote a few icons. It's an extraordinary experience. This is one of my pieces called the Sinai Christ Pantocrator. And as I was doing it, I was thinking of these layers and layers and, and, and uh, what they all meant. I mean, they were symbolic. They meant something. And then I came back and did this piece. It just erupted out of me. It's, it's like a prayer. This is called Pale Mail. Many of you have heard about it. Um, it's still a piece that mystifies me. Um, and um, in the center of it are the words love one another, but all the layers, all the things are coming in. Some of you know, um, I created out of that, I started doing paintings where you enter into the layers of the painting and go inside them. So this is one of those pieces you can do that with, but we don't have time. But in the chat, diamondscapes.com. Yes, I did name it after me, Diamondscapes. I thought it was a pretty good name. And people use it and they like it because you go, oh, it's an interactive painting and you can do this and that. And they go, Ross, have to use your name. Watch me, hello. Um, and you know what? Men have taken credit for the things they've named and I'm taking credit. And I want anyone here to do a diamond scape. We're not, I'd love to work with you on one. And, and if you call it that, I'm fine with that. I just want recognition, you know, for what I'm bringing to the table. Um, approach state four, we're getting there. As we get going, I'm getting older now. It goes beyond me and it goes further into us. And I think every teacher knows that. Um, and I must say what was interesting uh, as I regained traction again after Pale Mail and was doing interactive works, the Diamond Scapes, the last one of the recent pieces I did was not, I loaded my brush with other people's art. 
um, children, Latinos, and it was during COVID. And it was an incredible opportunity with funding by the NEA and local chapters. And these kids just, oh, they blew my mind and my heart. Talk about approach. I still was using that amazing brush that can do all this layering, all the stuff we've been talking about. And um, I put their all their artwork on my brush. People who've never met me go, Roz, you have such a, a childlike style, you know? And I go, no, you're not getting it. You know, this look at my other work, but but they are getting it. It is about that in between. And it's always a growth process, you know? And, and um, there's a little QR code on the wall where you can go inside this piece and hear all their voices and all the pieces come up. So they're kind of like a transparent collage is what I'm kind of, I'm the seamstress and they are the voices. And they were so excited to be in this piece. Look at this little kid. He's seen himself out to sea and they have little voices saying things like, oh, I wanted a boat, but we could not get one, you know, and in Spanish and, and you know, but they're, they're getting them now. <laughs> I think a lot of Latinos have more, more boats than, than some of us do out here in Long Island. And I'm all for it. Um, but it was wonderful working with them, reaching further alone and together, collaboration. Well, here we are. It's expressionism. Thank you, Colin Goldberg, Helen Harrison. But Colin, it was your baby and it has really turned into something. I love that it's documented like this. This is a whole chapter in history that we're giving to the next generation. Um, don't forget about wonder. Touch, digit, finger, heart, touch. I'm working on a new piece. It's, it's. Uh, I'm about to end here. Uh, it's about a, a young girl who gets, uh, you know, a message from an angel that you're going to have a baby. Now, that's a real loaded question right now, especially with a feminist like me and someone who's also religious. But it's going to have. This is being an advent calendar you've never seen before. I doubt I can get funding anywhere. But if you want to be on my board of directors or help me, please do. Uh, but it's going to be. Um, her looking back, uh, this is Mary with her helmet on and everything. Going. And she's a very contemporary young teenager. Um, and she's thinking about how she says yes and how she says no and how she owns her own body and, and also how she doesn't. And it'll be full of questions. Um, so that's exciting. And in our new AI, I just wanted to say chat GPT landscape. What could be more important than the human touch? I mean, let's bring our questions to it. Let's bring our questions and make them good. Um, I still think there's a heck of a lot going on in between those fingers, and you can see the ones and zeros of the ASCII code. Um, we've only started to explore it. And I love this quote by Bertolt Brecht. One can find a new beginning, even with your last dying breath. Amen. Let me stop sharing here. Thanks, Roz. Awesome presentation. Thank you. I, I love I love the the idea of that space between uh, the two fingers, between God and man. I just, God and woman, you know. Isn't that weird? <laughs> it seems like that's where I feel like we're all there. Yeah, trying to, I love that. Yeah. That's a great concept. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. You know, I like the parameter thing, like all of a sudden approaching, you know, what's that going to be? Well, it, it, it's huge, you know. So um, thank you for bringing this uh, presentation um, opportunity. Oh, yeah. Well, I think, uh, again, uh, not not to be not to try to rush things along here, but if you all uh, allow me um, the opportunity to share my screen just for a couple minutes here. Um, I will do that. So, you're seeing this fairly okay? Yeah. yeah. So, the idea of approach for me, uh, I'm, I'm going to use a little alliteration here, but for me, from my standpoint, it's all about exploring um, and it's about experimentation. That That's kind of my sense of how my artwork comes about. Um, and then in the sharing part, uh, for me, there's there's the idea of enigma and enlightenment, what I'm hoping people might take from my artwork, because I like to challenge people. I like to come at them from different, different points of view and maybe 
um, hopefully cause them a moment or two to think about something and maybe find a new perspective or some sense of enlightenment. Um, so from this one, um, th this, this is uh, a very recent piece that I did um, that I'm actually doing a, a, a small series about, um, and it's entitled Black Holes, Boltzmann Brains, and the Heat Death of the Universe. Um, and yeah, um, these are very, very thought-driven, experimental, conceptual ideas that uh, cosmologists and physicists think about when they're when they're looking at what theories about the universe we currently hold and what the implications are. And, and in some circles, um, there's this really weird concept called Boltzmann brains that's, that says if the universe lasts a long time, like trillions of years, I mean, it puts, puts to rest the, the thought of just billions, but trillions of years, um, it is possible that from quantum mechanics, fully formed brains, the molecules or the, the atoms can come together and create fully formed brains with thoughts of a life lived. This is technically possible within quantum mechanics. And so if, if the universe lasts long enough, there could be more Boltzmann brains in the universe that are imagining a reality that doesn't really exist, that's fully formed within case within these brains. And Okay, I know that sounds like a weary, very weird concept, but it also ties in with what's going on in a lot of neuroscience research, Buddhism, uh, about what's reality, um, et cetera, et cetera. So um, this was one uh, from that series again, uh, and here's a third one. Um, I like to focus on abstract, uh, algorithms and surrealism. And this, this was um, an, another recent work that I did that looked at um, the solemnity of perplexity. And by that, I was thinking about how could I work with an AI where I'm dealing with very weird or very abstract or high thought processes um, and what would come from it. Um, and here I wanted to really focus on like human connections. Um, how, how, how do you view this? If you were to see this, what, what's your reaction? Uh, do you see interaction there? Do you feel, does it feel dark? Does it feel uh, inviting or not? And so I did a, a number of these that could be viewed maybe in a number of different ways. But where where's where's the complexity? Where you know what 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 story could you write to to these uh, to these individuals? Um, so I'm going to stop sharing, um, and I wanted to really focus on. What does this approach, this idea of artistic approach, and Colin has made um, uh, in, in past uh, salon meetings that we've had, he's, he's made a very big point that initially, until Helen Harrison uh, you know, made a suggestion to use approach versus style, um, why is that important? What's fundamental about that from your perspective, what you shared today, that brings us all together because if you look at each one of our works and we're just a small microcosm of the greater sum of international artists in this in this community how did how has approach uh been a good you know word to use versus technique yeah Ross. 
Well, I feel we have a, a whole new faster moving uh, and informational universe at our, our fingertips. You know, our brush. I mean, you know, I have a little coffee cup that says, why does Picasso get eight periods and a woman only gets one? I mean, that's a ha-ha funny kind of joke I'm making as a feminist. But but I mean, you can have, I think that Gerhard Richter sort of started us on this. You know, he, he did a ton of different styles and yet his art is his and it has a story. And the curators, I challenge them right now to to find all these different stories where, and different styles we're doing rather than, uh, I mean, I love Sean Scully. I used to paint right next to him and he does stripes and they're wonderful. But, you know, I, I do think we're in a more um, sped up universe in a way. Um, and we're, our access is immediate. Even kids in kindergarten get art all over the world in their, just in their little iPhones in one day. And it is just very disruptive, but it's also pretty fantastic. So your whole concept of the Uber moon or whatever's coming next, you know, that combines everything is fascinating to me. Um, but um, I, I think that approach, it gets more back into the, the person themselves and what they're trying to say throughout all their styles, you know, which is kind of what I just, my presentation was kind of like, they're, all, they're different styles, but they're always, they're evolving and going backwards and forwards. I mean, even with all the work that I have, I feel like I'm, and I feel your work slows, it slowed me down the way a great painting does. You know, I don't even want to make a story. It's, it's just, or maybe, but it's a, a great painting slows you down. So you look at it, you know? Um, I mean, a diamond scape, if the technology's out, you can still, it should still be a really great painting if possible that makes people interested. Um, so I, I think, I guess I've mixed up a lot of things, but I always do that. Um, but I'm sorry, it's just who I am. But um, I, I love um, the questions you're posing. And, and I think approach was a brilliant stroke by Helen. Absolutely, for that reason. You know, we're, we're telling stories in a different way. I mean, I sometimes go to gallery shows, even my own, like, oh, it's a little gallery show of pictures on the wall. I, I think we're beyond, I think we're, I think we're going somewhere else, mm. you know, and, and I don't even want to, I mean, it took me forever to get in a New York gallery and, you know, and, but I, I think that they're, they're, that the gallery, it's, it's out somewhere else and through this space we're talking about and, and approach and finding about the people behind them and what their stories are and why they did that. Tommy lived here and who was he, what was he doing? And, you know, I think that that kind of thing, curators can come in and tell the story and, and put all those, you know, different styles together and a certain approach that makes the artist come through to people. Mm. There's the challenge. How about you, Renata? Oh, you're, you're muted. You're still muted. It's an interesting question that you pose. I think, you know, we are in a moment where the walls have come down and people are constantly bombarded with visual stimuli, constantly. So for us as makers of visuals, I think editing is really important. And I think a slow, long process is important as well. We have a couple minutes to kind of wrap things up. So Tommy, what about you? I mean, approach seems to be so fundamental to this technology you've kind of created using the, uh, the pie, uh, and raspberry pie? <laughs> yeah, the raspberry pie. Sorry, yeah, I forgot the fruit. I've hardly unwrapped mine, but Tommy's been an influence. <laughs> but, but, it, but it's not, I mean, but it's not confining. And, and that's to me what's really interesting about this idea of approach. It, it maybe helps define you in some way, but it's not confining. And I think uh, it's interesting, Renata and Roz are talking about this uh, duration of time that you spend mm -hmm. with something and i think that actually is the difference i yeah. think if you're swiping fast through images it's confining actually when you spend yes. time with one then it's actually kind of liberating because yes. your mind is then free to make associations that's a good or point. whatever um so yeah i mean i've been working uh, gosh the raspberry pi is um it's over 10 years old right i mean it's been I, I want to say 2009 or something like that. It's been around, maybe it's 2013. So maybe it's about 10 years old. Um, you know, and I feel like I um, spent a lot of time just playing with it 
you know, and, and without even doing my work in a way, you know, it's sort of, there, there's a, um, there's a lot of process that, that happens, you know, that's sort of tossed off. That's, you know, the left on the studio floor and cuttings as Renata said, like edited. And that's really a huge part of, I think my process in a way is that, um, is the human touch, um, the viewing and touching the button of yes or thumbs up at this point? I mean, um, uh, or, uh, and, and then if it is, you know, why do we make those choices and what's informing that um, decision to, to choose something over something else? Uh, you know, what, where is that tension of that moment of, you know, the fingers about to touch um, showing up uh, maybe as a surprise even. And that's something that I um, think is really interesting uh, as a photographer are these moments of surprise when, when I find something that I didn't expect. Mm. So maybe that's what I'm looking for as, you know, something to, you know, stand out when, you know, choosing between other pictures or uh, as I'm going through sketches and designs, you know, um, what surprised me. And I, I, I mean, I really think that Roz and Renata and my work too, and your work, Michael, has that element of like, you, you have a level of surprise within it. There's an un, there's the layering as we, you know, we're talking about, like, but within that layering are these unexpected uh, interactions that mm -hmm. take time to visually perceive. Um, so, great. Yeah. All I, right, and I, I do want to mention, I've said it so many times, but I feel all of us are, are part of what I would call, I mean, a whole visual language, new language that is arising that we are a part of. And um, and it's it's hard work, you know, like to your point, Tommy, and and I guess Renata, or maybe I don't remember who said the editing, maybe it was Michael, but there's so much editing, you know, it's like, you don't just build a diamond scape willy nilly. It's like, oh my God, I mean, it's just, ah, uh, you know, and this can go forward and that, I mean, all the freedom does bring you a lot of tension. So if you don't have a strong vision of where you want to go, and yeah. I'm not sure where that comes from, Tommy, we, maybe childhood, I didn't wear glasses and it <laughs> affected me in a weird way. But, um, you know, it's, um, you're, I'm always going for something, but it's arduous work, you know, and we've had doors close on us and it hasn't been easy and it's been fun, but it's been an arduous path and yeah. and uh, an exciting one. But I agree there, the surprise is that we're going snowballing and now going into AI, it's moving fast. So I feel in some ways art artists like, can make one picture of many can slow it down and we can access that speed but slow it down and bring some kind of um meaningfulness to the mm. space you know like the new cave wall well we're about uh time to wrap things up here i i really appreciate um roz and tommy and renata for uh doing this um I have to say that um, you all were chosen because I had interviewed you before in the artist interview series and Roz had interviewed me as well. So this, this feels like a good way to kind of start off 2023. Uh, I'm hoping to do several more of these throughout the year. Um, and I really feel that the idea of artistic approach versus artistic technique um, allows us uh, to be part of this group because if it was all just narrowly kind of focused on one way of doing things, I don't think we'd all be in this um, grand experiment together. And I, I've learned so much from each of you and I've gained so much as an artist from each of you that um, I, I'm really grateful for this. So. Many thanks, and uh, we'll be seeing each other uh, soon enough, I'm sure. So, um, thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. Yes, thanks, Michael. This is really all fun. Right. All right, awesome. <laughs>